We've been talking, loved ones, during these past months about being free. Just living as really free people, you know. Free from oh, all the character traits and the behavior patterns that prevent us being what we want to be. We've talked about being free from those things. And, oh, some of us this morning would love, after the benediction, to really talk to others. We'd really like to socialize. But we just have a crippling self-consciousness and crippling feelings of inferiority that make us withdraw into ourselves and make us scuttle away after the benediction and try to get away from everybody. And many of us here are in the grip of all kinds of vices that we can't shake. And however many resolutions we make, it seems that the fear of people or the lust or the envy run our lives so that the good we want to do we can't do and the evil that we hate that's the thing we do what we've been seeing during these months is that the reason our will is so ineffectual to control these feelings and these character traits is that our whole personality is perverted and twisted. And so the will itself seems to be paralyzed. And really the whole personality is perverted and twisted because we live like orphans. We really live like orphans. We live as if there's nobody to take care of us, We've kind of been placed here by chance. We have to provide for ourselves and take care of ourselves. We have to somehow make our own way in society. We have to make our own mark on other people. And so we live like orphans. And our personalities have developed those traits because we live like orphans. So we have developed animal-like kind of defense mechanisms of fight, fright, flight, just to protect ourselves. So we find our personality is that of an orphan or a little animal that has nobody taking care of it. And we fight for recognition. And we're afraid all the time of losing the security that we've got. And our life is a constant flight from anything that's unpleasant or that looks as if it would make us unhappy. And yet, though we eat to get rid of our fear and we curry favor with our peers to get rid of our feelings of rejection and we go out of our way to try to be happy Yet the real trouble is not our eating. The real trouble is not our man fear or our slavishness to people's opinions. The real trouble is not our hedonism. The real trouble is our whole personality is the twisted, perverted personality of people that live like orphans. People that are committed to trying to get from others the love and the security that can only come from regarding the Father of Jesus, who is our Creator, as our own loving Father. And yet we find that our personality does not operate like that. So, you know, we make our resolutions, but it seems as if you have a little pickaxe and you're trying to remove a whole mountain with that little pickaxe. You're trying to affect a tiny little activity or behavior pattern that is part of a 
whole big problem that is far greater than that. And the whole big problem is that our personalities do not operate like children of God, but our personalities operate like little estranged, alienated orphans. And the problem is not how to change our eating habits, really, or how to change some drug that we take, or how to stop smoking, or how to stop being angry. The problem is how to change our whole personality. And you know that that's what we discovered God had done for us. And that, loved ones, is in Romans 6, and maybe you just look at it and Read it, Romans 6 and verse 3, you remember. Romans 6 and verse 3, it's page 981. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And that's God's love in Christ. God took your petty, squalid little personality and destroyed it in Jesus and raised you up as a new creation with all the natural attitudes and reactions of a child of His. Now that's what happened, loved ones. That happened. That was miraculously achieved by God in Jesus. And it's not up to you to try to make yourself his child. That has been done. God has already done that. And so what we've been saying is, it's a lie when you say you can't stop smoking. It's a lie if I say I can't stop losing my temper. It's a lie when you say you can't stop unclean pictures rising in your mind. It's a lie when you say you can't stop being sarcastic with other people. It's a lie. You can because God changed the personality that used to be able to operate only in that way. And you're telling a lie when you say you can't change. Because, in fact, God has changed you. All those attitudes that we talk about, being lustful, being unclean, being selfishly ambitious, being sarcastic, come from that little orphan, that little defenseless animal that thinks that he or she is on her own in this world and has to make her own way. And once that personality has been destroyed in Jesus which is what it means when God says our old self was crucified with him. Once that has been destroyed, all the reactions that it produces are no longer natural to us. And you can simply change them like that. Now, loved ones, that's it. That's what God says. Now, you see it in again in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, it's page 1006. 1006. Second Corinthians 5 and 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, we were all sin. Sin is living independent of God and trying to get from the world and other people the sense of importance and sense of value and the affection and the love that you should receive from God. Now, that created an old rutted personality so that you feel you're in ruts at times. You know, you want to get out of them, but you can't. That created an old rutted personality that always struck out at others when you were ignored. 
that always curried favor with others because you wanted other people's love and attention. Now, that rutted personality was put into Jesus. He became all that we were, and God destroyed that in him so that we are able to become what he is, a loving, trusting son of his Father. So really, loved ones, honestly, it is never, you cannot stop losing your temper. It really isn't. It is that you don't want to stop losing your temper. It is never that you can't stop being impure. It is that you don't want to stop being impure. It really is. It's just we say, I can't, but really it's we won't. It's not that you cannot change because God already changed you in Jesus. The whole thing has already been done. It's like... Someone making this suit of clothes for me. And I don't have to come along and sew the whole thing up and fit myself. The suit of clothes is ready. All I have to do is put them on. Now that's it, loved ones. Honestly. And you, it's like me looking at a suit of clothes that looks very light and thin. And I say, oh no, those won't keep me warm. And you have made them and you know they'll keep me warm. But I have to go in faith. I have to put the clothes on. And then I suddenly feel they keep me warm. Now, it's like that with us. You have to say, I'm willing to change. And I believe, Lord, that if I'm willing to believe that you have done this to me in Jesus, and I start believing that and acting on it, then I will actually begin to feel the results in my own life. And that's the truth, loved one. That's what it is. I think some of us here this morning say, well, yeah, we know what you say, and we really believe it. But there is a little voice that whispers inside me and says, you can't change. It'll work for everybody but you. But you've treated people this way for so many years that you can't change. You've been addicted to the caffeine or you've been addicted to the aspirin if you, you've been addicted to the alcohol or you've been addicted to using your wife or using your friends for so long that you can't change. Now, I think many of us here probably say, yeah, yeah, that's right. I believe what you're saying this morning but I have to tell you that there is a voice inside me that says to me, but I can't change. Now, whose voice is that? With some of us, loved ones, we'd better be straight. With some of us, it's the voice of our own wills. It is. It's just we're so subtle that we've learned to change that voice. The voice, really, if it was honest, says, you don't want to change. But uh, that doesn't sound too heroic. So we switch it into, you can't change. And really, we mean, you don't want to change. Some of us are like people who uh, observed old uh, Mark, you know, winning the eight or nine gold medals at the Olympics. And we see that, and we say, oh, I'd like to win eight or nine gold medals at the Olympics. And we kind of listen to this on Sunday morning and we say, oh, I'd like to be that kind of person. Oh, I'd like to be generous and kind and patient and I'd like to always be at peace. I'd like just not to have so much trouble with myself. I'd love that. And we say, oh, I really want it. What we mean is we really would like to have it. We want it with our feelings. We desire it, you know. But not that we're willing to face the consequences of joining Jesus in his death to the right to sympathy, or his death to the right to other people's approval, or his death to the right to comfort, or his death to the right to pleasure, except what God gives him. We're not prepared to face those consequences. We're not to, prepared to join old Mark in that old swimming pool, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, half a mile with the arms, a mile with the legs. No. We like the idea of the gold medals, but we don't like the things that you have to do to get the gold medals. And I think some of us, honestly... I just don't think it's being too hard to say that some of us this morning are in that situation. Some of us have a little voice inside that says, you can't change. And it's really the voice of our own will saying, you don't want to change. 
You don't want to die to everybody else's approval but God's. Because everybody else's approval, you can kind of control by the things you do. You know, you can stand on your head or say the Lord's Prayer backwards or something. And, and you can kind of get approval when you need to get it. But this business of depending on God to give you his approval, well, you can't switch them on and off. And so many of us are not prepared to die to what we get from the world and people and trust only what Jesus got from his Father because we can't control all that. So many of us have a voice inside us saying, you can't change, but it's really the voice of our will saying you don't want to change. Now, it's important, loved ones, for you to identify if that's the situation with yourself. I think some of us are prepared to die to all comfort but what Jesus received. I honestly think that some of us here this morning are really prepared to die to any pleasure but what Jesus received on Calvary. I think there are some of us here who are prepared to die to everything but what God gives us in the way of love and attention. And yet we too have a little voice inside us saying, you can't change. You can't change. Now, loved ones, if you are really prepared to die with Jesus to everything that he died to, if you are really prepared to stop depending on other people, on things and on experiences for your security, your significance and your happiness, and if God himself worked the change in Jesus to make you capable of being his child, then it's not your voice that's speaking, and it's not God's voice. Whose voice is it? Loved ones, I'd like, to, I'd like you to look at it. It's in Romans 8 and 38. It's Romans 8 and 38. You remember that verse runs, For I am sure that none of these things will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then Paul mentions them, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities. Now, angels is the Greek word angeloi, and principalities is the Greek word archai. Angels are spirit beings that Jesus created to serve his Father throughout creation. They don't have wings, but they're spirits. And they don't have bodies like ours. But they have free wills. And some of them are rulers. That's what principalities are called. Some of them are rulers over certain areas of the world and certain activities in the world. So there are spirit beings that can control even things like finances. And Satan was one of those angels. And he used his free will to rebel against God and to set himself up as a ruler. And God has permitted him to test our free wills during our lifetime here on earth. He has only one power, and that's the power that produces that voice inside you. That's why Paul says here, not even angels or principalities can separate us from God's love. But I think some of us here this morning do, in fact, allow those angels and principalities to separate us. Now, here's the power that he has, loved ones. It's in John 8 and verse 44. John 8 and verse 44. It's page 932. John 8 and 44. You are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. And the voice that many of us here this morning hear saying, you can't stop swearing. You can't stop being indolent and lazy. You can't stop smoking. You can't stop being sarcastic. 
are hearing the voice of Satan, loved ones. And he is lying to you. And he is saying, you can't. And yet you see that Paul says that not even angels or principalities can separate us from God's love. Why then are you separated often from the transforming work that God has done to you in Jesus? Why are you separated from it by these angels and principalities? Well, I think, first of all, because many of you don't believe that there is a personal power of evil called Satan. Really? I think many of us are like that. I I was like that. I really listened to people talking about Satan, but I thought, well, it's kind of a picture that they have for personalizing uh, evil to children. But I, I don't really believe there is a Satan who can kind of initiate or inject or insert thoughts into my mind. And loved ones, I think many of you come under Satan's power because when you hear that voice, you refuse to identify it as Satan's because you don't really believe that Satan exists or that he can insert thoughts into your mind. And so do you see what happens? The thought comes up And you identify it as coming from your own reason. Or as coming from your own rutted personality that has become so used to these habits that it's actually speaking to you and saying, no, you can't do it, you can't do it. You've been lying in bed to this hour for years. You can't change. You've been smoking for years. You can't change. You think it's your whole personality speaking to you. And crying out to you and saying, no, you can't change. Loved ones, your personality doesn't speak. Especially after it has been crucified with Christ. And if your heart is set towards God's will for you and to a change in your life, it's not you that are speaking. It's not your reason that is speaking. It is Satan himself who is whispering to you. You cannot change. But do you see, loved ones, what you do? You identify it with yourself. And so you think, this is my own mental process is saying I can't change, and it's just the testimony of reality. Of course I can't change. I know the psychologists tell me that once I've started being like this, there's a determinism that keeps, me on be, uh, keeps on being like this. I can't change. This is my whole being testifying to me that I can't change. And so you identify it with yourself, And so you refuse to reject it. That's it. You refuse to reject it. Because you think, this this is my own idea that I can't change. So I'm just playing a mental bluff game with myself if I start refusing that idea. Loved ones, the truth is the idea does not come from you. Now, God states this plainly in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. It's page 1020. 1,020. Ephesians 6 and 12. And it's the failure to realize this that makes many of us align ourselves with Satan's opinion or with his lie. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, loved ones, if I could only come with you in your own dear heart. When you go to the closet or you go to the refrigerator for the wine or for the whiskey or for the food, There is nothing in your body or personality or emotions that makes you do that. You think it's your body and your personality that makes you do it. It isn't. That was crucified with Christ. It's utterly changed. But Satan's voice whispers to you and justifies it and suggests, really, you have to do this. And it is your acceptance of his lie that makes you do it. Honestly, it is. It's not the flesh and blood you're wrestling against. 
It's not that your old personality is used to that and can only operate that way. That has been changed. It has been crucified with Christ. But Satan reminds you of the way it used to be and persuades you that it's still that today. And what actually deceives you and gets you to drink or to smoke or to lose your temper or to be sarcastic is you listen to Satan's suggestion to your mind that this is a very justified thing to do. And it's a thing that you can't avoid doing. Loved ones, truly. And actually all you have to do is resist him and he'll flee from him. That's it. If you'd only at that moment resist him, he would flee from him. Really. Now don't you come at me and say, oh, you mean by the power of positive thinking you drive the terrible urge away? Do you know that there isn't a terrible urge? You, I know you won't believe it. Because Satan has persuaded you there's a terrible urge. There is no terrible urge because that was destroyed in Jesus and Calvary. And you're believing Satan's lie that it was not. And you're being led out after his lie. And it is not the urge that drives you to do it. It is him telling you the lie. You have to do it. You can't avoid it. You've been doing it for years. And loved ones, actually, all you have to do is turn around and go the other way. Really. All you have to do is resist him. Now, that's, uh, you maybe should look at that because some of you will probably need to do it. James 4 and verse 7. James 4 and verse 7. It is really, loved ones, the greatest bluff, you know, that is practiced upon human beings. James 4 and verse 7. Page 1056. James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's it. The moment that thought comes to your mind that you cannot do it, all you have to do is resist it. Resist it and believe what God has said is true, that your personality has been changed in Calvary. Now, I warn you, Satan will come round the back of you and say, oh, you're just playing games with yourself. Just the power of positive thinking. Loved ones, it isn't. It's reality that you were, in fact, destroyed with Jesus. It's not a thought that will produce some dynamic in your life. It's a work that was actually done in Calvary. And Satan is the liar telling you that it was not done. I think that's one reason why some of us feel that we're not able to change or hear that voice inside us. I think another reason is this, that we listen to Satan's idea of victory in our lives. Now, here it is in Revelation 12 and 10. Revelation 12 and 10. It's page 1079. 1079. Revelation 12 and 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. I think some of you don't enter into reality because you listen to Satan's accusations. And you really, you do exactly what he tells you. He says, Look at yesterday. Did you get up in time for prayer yesterday? Did you? Did you? And we dum-dums, we look at it and we say, No, you're right, we didn't. We didn't. (laughs) And he says, Look at the day before. Didn't you lose your temper with your friend? Didn't you? And we follow him, just dragged by the nose. And we say, You're right, we did. We did. (laughs) And he says... Don't you have feelings of envy against that person? Don't you? And we say, you're right. And Satan all the time points to the individual things that we are doing or saying that are not in consistency with the fact that we have been crucified with Christ. And so he somehow bluffs us into thinking that we therefore have not been crucified with Christ. Now, loved ones, the fact is, all the talk in the world cannot change that cosmic crucifixion that you experienced in Jesus. 
You can live according to a lie if you want, but you can't change reality. And reality is that God has destroyed that old orphan parasitic personality of yours in Calvary. And that has been done. And not all the lying in the world will change it. And not all the pointing to any failure in you to let that reality live in your life can change the reality. Loved ones, it has happened. But Satan tries to persuade you that you're involved in crucifying yourself. He tries to persuade you, listen, you lost your temper yesterday, that means you're not crucifying yourself, doesn't it? You're getting sarcastic. That means you aren't crucifying yourself. It's not your job to crucify yourself. It's been done. It's been done. Your only job is to let it come out through you. But Satan persuades you that you have to involve yourself in some kind of self-improvement scheme. In other words, it's like the old tow rope, you know. That tow rope is going up that mountain and you're on your skis. All you have to do is put your hand on that tow rope and you're going up that mountain. You may go up on your stomach. You may go up on your bottom. Tow rope, you're going up one way or the other. And hundreds of people may stand around and say, Ah, ah, you've fallen, you've fallen. Yeah, yeah, but I'm going up. There's a power. There's a power that is taking me up and it's established by the person who created the world. And that power is taking me up And you may even, your hand may even slip off. And okay, a dozen gather around and say, yeah, yeah, you slipped off, you slipped off. All you do is put your hand on the door rope again and you're on. Loved ones, that's it. But you see that Satan gets you all preoccupied with the the fact that you've slipped for the moment. Or you haven't allowed the death of Jesus to be complete in some part of your life. Yes, But don't get down under it. Don't make a big battle about masturbation. Don't make a big battle about alcohol. Don't make a big battle about nicotine. Just accept, Lord, I have no need of these things. Thank you. Thank you that I'm a changed person. And loved ones, as you throw out the 25th whiskey bottle out of the car, you know? You know the fellow who says, stopping smoking is easy. I've stopped it hundreds of times. (laughs) And you keep throwing out that thing. That's what you do. You keep throwing it out. You keep throwing it out. I don't care how many whiskey bottles you throw out. You keep throwing them out of the car on the way to work the next day. You keep throwing away the packs of cigarettes. You keep standing against the sarcasm that you've expressed to your friend. You keep standing against the unclean thoughts. You set your heart with what God has done on Calvary. And loved ones, that's what God looks at. He's not looking at every time you slip off the tow rope. He's trying to decide, are you determined to go where I have arranged for you to go? To the top of that mountain. Have you set your heart that way? Then that's all I ask. And if you keep, if you keep with me, the power of Calvary will actualize itself in your life and will change you. But loved ones, that's it. It's not a, I succeeded yesterday, maybe I'll succeed today. No. It's yesterday has been destroyed with Jesus, and Lord, I'm going that way. But you see that Satan's job is to point out to you, now you haven't kept your resolution, have you? You haven't done what you said you'd do. And of course, he's laying emphasis on your ability to do it. Your only task is to say, no, and I can never do it. That's why I was destroyed in Jesus. And I thank God that all I have to do is accept that and keep setting my heart against these things and keep standing off from them and repenting of them and keep moving away from them. And God, by what he has done in Calvary, will make that victory real in me. So, loved ones, it is his will for us all to be free of those things. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I don't think we're here to keep doing those things. But do you see the way you come into victory on them? is not laying emphasis on the things or the words or the actions, but laying emphasis on the fact that you have been changed. God has changed you. That's his word. You believe that. You don't believe any temporary evidences of your own experience. There's only one other thing that I'd like to mention that I think brings some of you under this power of Satan's lie you can't change. And that is, there are some of you who have lived so much in your minds in the realm of Rosemary's baby and the exorcist, and the occult. There are some of you who have thought so much about these things, about these angels and principalities, that you think it is their power that is chaining you 
to the bad habits. I think some of you think that. Some of you really do think that Satan has power. You really think he has power. And that's why you stop struggling. You say, oh no, there's a power here that's holding me to the alcohol. There's a power here that is holding me to this selfish ambition. There's a power here that is holding me to these critical thoughts that I have. There's a power that is holding me to these things. It's chaining me to them. I can't get away from it. Loved ones, Satan has no power. That's it. That's the truth that God tells us. Satan has no power. He has an ability to lie. He can pervert us to misuse the power of nuclear energy that God has planted in his world. He can lie to us and deceive us into misusing our abilities so that we exploit the world instead of develop it. But he has no power himself. He has only the ability to lie to us and deceive us to misuse the powers that God has given us. But Satan himself has no power. Now that's stated plainly in Colossians 2 and 15. Colossians 2 and 15. It's page 1027. Colossians 2 and 15. And it's these same principalities that Paul talks about in Romans 8. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. Satan has been disarmed and he does not have power. And so, loved ones, really it's true. You could stop whatever you're doing now just by deciding. That's it. All you have to do is decide. The only thing that can stop you from being free from whatever addiction you have or from being free from whatever personality trait is destroying your personal relationships with others. The only thing that can stop you from being free is your own unbelief that you were crucified with Christ or your own unwillingness to accept that crucifixion. But loved ones, if you believe and you're willing, you can stop today, really. Because God changed your personality in Calvary. Your old self was crucified there. And God is simply asking you to believe that and stop. I know it sounds wild, but honestly, honestly, it's like walking that way and you decide to walk that way. It's as easy as that. It truly is. And I know the agony, because I was in the agony too. And I know the agony some of you are in. But it is an agony that comes from accepting lies from Satan. It's not an agony that needs to be there. So I pray, you know, that some of you will just decide this morning. And then, if necessary, decide tomorrow. And decide tomorrow and tomorrow. But never, 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 Never give up. Never accept that what Satan has been lying to you as normal is normal. It isn't. What's normal is a life free from anything that would spoil your relationship with your father or with each other. That's it. Let's pray. Dear Father, we really pray for each other this morning because we know there are loved ones beside us who just want to believe this. And they want to have done with it now. Lord, we pray now for them. Pray for each other, Father. And I pray, Lord, for my dear brothers and sisters that they will just decide now that this is truth and they're going to walk this way. However long it takes them to get onto that old tow rope, they will keep their hand on it. And they will be dragged by one way or another by the power of Calvary to that position at your right hand as your dear sons and daughters. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you. Trust you for each other this week that many of us here will live in victory for the first time in our lives for your glory. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.